What's going on, man? I don't know. No. First the game. The game's all here. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
How truly wonderful and delightful to see brothers and sisters living in sweet unity. It is precious as sacred scented oil flowing from the head of the high priest Aaron, dripping down upon his beard and running all the way down to the hem of his priestly robes. This heavenly harmony can be compared to the dew dripping down from the skies upon Mount Hermon, refreshing the mountain slopes of Israel. For from this realm of sweet harmony, God will release his eternal blessing and promise for life forever.
you've set the captives free. You've promised to free us from our bondage. You've promised to restore those relationships. You've promised to set me free from my sick thinking. You've promised me, God, to, that you would set us free from any of the past. You've promised, God, that you would that you would rescue us from mistakes of our own making, that the messes that we make on our own, that you would rescue us from that. And so we know that your promises are good. We know that if it's not good, it's not done. God, we know that if it's not good, it's not done. And so we rest in your promise. We rest in your promise. We know that you've never failed and you're not going to start now. We thank you, God. When we say hallelujah, that's my thanks, that's my praise. I say hallelujah and thank you, God, because I know you're good. I know you're faithful. <laughs> hallelujah.
Do you remember the verse? The verse that they're learning is Ephesians 2.10. And we're learning about how we are God's masterpiece. We are all God's masterpiece, not just the kids. Yesterday God reminded me that I am beautifully and wonderfully made. And all of us are beautifully and wonderfully made. 
So I made this basket. Can you all see this basket? This basket says, sponsor a kid t-shirt fund, and it says, I am a master, I am God's masterpiece, Ephesians 2.10. So the kids and the, the kids are going to make t-shirts, and the t-shirts are going to be this. They're all going to have t-shirts. So this is to offset the cost of the t-shirts so that nobody has any financial hardship over providing a t-shirt for their kid. Okay, so we're all going to give to the t-shirt fund as we feel led to. Kids, kids, can we all extend our hands towards the kids? God, we bless these kids as they go. We know that they are not junior Holy Spirits, that they have full Holy Spirit, yeah. that they are fully, fully equipped yeah. to serve you and to learn about you, and they're going to do it with honor and respect and obedience, and you're going to listen well, right? And you can now go find your parents and help have them check you in. All right, the rest of the announcements. Everybody listening? What's tomorrow night? Very good. You've all been paying attention. Bill Vanderbush will be here tomorrow night, so there will be no Bible bit. Bible Blitz with Bruce tomorrow night will not happen. We will resume the following week. And Bill and Tracy will be with us. Service starts at 6 o'clock here at the church. That was a change of venue. It is here at the church at 6 o'clock. All right? And Women's Weekly, we're having a fabulous time. And if the women want to come to the Zoom group, it's been amazing. Um, that's at 7 o'clock on Thursdays. The Zoom link is posted on our website and on our Facebook page. Came to Believe Midwest Retreats Community Appreciation. That's a mouthful. A community appreciation party is Saturday, next Saturday, this coming Saturday, at 4 o'clock at Sean and Libby's house, uh, live, live blues band, free food, powerful 12-step speaker. Yes, everybody's welcome. And then, this one, everybody needs to listen up. The 28th of August, there is no church here. Do not come to the church building. There will be nobody here. We will all be at Libby and Sean's house for an outdoor service and a cookout. The church will provide the grilled meat. Everybody else will provide your side dishes and desserts. You all may bring whatever you care to bring. I don't think I'm even going to do a sign-up sign sheet. Just bring something to contribute to the meal. And then bring your own beverages and bring your own chairs. Did I cover everything? <laughs> and then offering. Why do we give? Why do we give? Because it's who we are. It's who we are. God created us to be giving and generous people, correct? And he blesses us, so we give to bless others. Okay, so this church, this church is amazingly giving, but we, we, give, we give a large portion of that money back to people who need it. All right, so we're going to give generously. And we have Venmo, PayPal, text to give, and if you would like it to write a check or put money in an envelope, the envelopes are in the window. Thank you. And Sean Michael Higgins. You know, one of the reasons I love to give is to remind myself that I live in the New Testament, so I'm back restored to the garden, which means there's no lack. I don't have any need to hoard things to myself anymore because I have a father who provides for it all. Everything. Everything. Wow, I thought I'd get a higher little... <laughs> Wow, what's going on? Dave's laughing about the chair. See, all you guys are wondering why he huffed at the chair because we went to something together and I was a real nice guy and I got him a chair and I set it down for him and uh, he sat in it and there was a reason nobody else was sitting in it because it was broken. So it broke and it fell and he thinks to this day that I did it on purpose because I was laughing because it, was, it wasn't like he just crashed to the floor. It was like a slow like bang and then it was done, and I thought it was funny, and he didn't think it was so funny, so <clears throat> when he hopped at the, at the beginning, that's why. <laughs> yeah, that's why you got to bring your own chair. I ain't getting blamed for that again. 
Oh, boy. This week has been, you know, I have ended up in Arkansas two times in the last two weeks, and I never planned on being there. So uh, that's how my life's been going lately. And um, it was cool, though, because I said, God, why am I in Arkansas this second time? And he said, because I really need your attention, and now you're going to be on a plane flight, so we're going uh, to talk. We're going to go through some stuff in Scripture. Uh, and he really got my attention, and I ended up going through the whole book of Matthew, which was awesome. Maybe I missed a few of the first chapters. But when it concluded, I'm telling you, I'm listening to it on my audiobook. When it concluded, I look out the plane window in the most beautiful sunset as the, as the book is, uh, is finishing. So it's been a pretty spectacular week, too, as well. So um, one thing I want to do, though, is somebody stole the truck from me on Wednesday. They went to my work. Yeah, they... They broke in, they, they took a bunch of, they, they stole, they spent two and a half hours at my neighbor's business cutting off Cadillac converters. So they were coming to me next. They got in the truck, they started it, um, GPS started beeping, and uh, they got scared, so they ditched it. They tried to cut it out first, but they only made it a couple blocks. This is the second time the truck's been stolen, and I love it because now we get an opportunity to pray for some people. They were at my place, they took my things, I get to release forgiveness, and we get to actually pray into their life in a way that's going to release power. So I want you guys to join with me right now as we extend to these two young men who happen to take a, a path that maybe we had wished we hadn't. Who's been there? We've all been there. No judgment. So uh, God, we just say right now that the Holy Spirit would just get them and would rock them in such a way that they would tangibly feel you. And they'd, they'd keep thinking about that truck they stole, and they'd want to get to know the owner, and they'd want to come back and apologize. And maybe they'd want to come to this church, and maybe they'd want to find Jesus, and maybe they'd want to turn their whole life around so that they can experience the beautiful abundance of everything you have to offer because they're not less than us. They just happen to make some bad decisions on a Wednesday night, and we say they actually might have been good decisions because now you get to enter their life, Lord, in a powerful way. So we release that all in Jesus' name. Amen. I do pray over all my stuff. If someone steals this, God get them in a good way. I don't even need it back. I just, see, because I don't have any lack. Because, I, you know, you guys are kind of following me on that. Yeah, so if you, if you feel like you need my truck more than I do, have it and see what God does. He didn't make you, he didn't let you get very far. The last time someone took that exact same truck, it didn't get very far either. No, it was the pickup. Ford F-250. Well, hey, hey, whoa, what's going on? I am no respecter of cars. It could have been a Nissan or a Hyundai. I don't care. I'm not, I don't care. All right, all right. I need you. Come on, guys. This is church. You guys got to be serious. Jeepers. All right, so this is just going to ramp up a whole nother level because we have cows. We don't know uh, what we're doing with cows. In fact, one of our cows had a baby. We didn't even know it was pregnant. We just looked in the field and it was like, whoa, a calf. <laughs> yeah, holy cow. We took it as a prophetic sign, like new birth, new birth. <laughs> so yesterday, they're like, You'll, they're like, you got to look for these signs to see if your cow's in heat. So we're like, I've never, ever, in the whole time owning these cows, ever seen him do that. I was like, I don't know, how am I going to ever catch that? So, um, so of course, the fence breaks. God uses all good things, all things for the good of those who love him and are called his person. So I'm all fixing the fence, and I see him do it. I'm like, that one's in heat. So I call Libby. I'm like, hey, uh, um, what do I do? <laughs> Cause she, cause she talked to the vet, so the vet's like, "You, uh, I gotta come over in a half hour." So I'm like, "A half hour?" Like I'm like, "I've never ever corralled this cow." The last time I saw a vet try to do it, it was bad news. But I'm like, "All right, I got it." So I get out there, I make the corral, 
I, I ratchet it tight. I get this thing in there. The guy jumps in. He's doing his business. The kids are like, whoa, what's going on? You know, we're like, I'm like, this is great, talking birds and bees. I mean, this is why you have a farm in the first place, right? You get to talk about all that challenging stuff. And um, when I was done, I was covered in so much cow crap. I'm telling you. <laughs> and God said, this is what it's like when you start to try to birth something new. You're not even in the birthing process. You've just made the decision to start trying to get this cow pregnant, and it's already very messy. It's already very messy. And this is what happens in our life. See, also this week, I decided that I was going to cut out sugar, and I was going to cut out, cut down on caffeine. So I haven't even seen the results of that yet. And all of you extend your hands toward my wife. My life's been pretty messy. I've been pretty, pretty crabby. I've been a bear. So if you come, if you need prayer after church, don't come up to me. But what I'm trying to, what I'm trying to say is, is God show, it, it's all around us. He speaks to us in so many different ways to see like, okay, I'm deciding I want to do something new. For those of you in the Onyx, I'm deciding I want to jump into a halfway house or into a program. I want to make a change of life. And just that one decision causes you to all of a sudden have a lot of messes around you. A lot of stuff around you that gets stirred up. You haven't even begun birthing the miracle. You haven't even begun changing yet. You haven't even seen the head breach and start to come out. You just made up your mind. And the next thing you know, you're with a vet covered in a whole bunch of cow manure. That was just a side note. This isn't even my message today. So, <clears throat> so one of the things, I, I want you guys to buckle up though, and I want you to keep two things in mind as we go into this. God's conviction, when he convicts your spirit, it's never for shame and condemnation. It's always to show you a place inside of you where you could fit more of him. I'm going to say it again. God's conviction, the Holy Spirit's conviction in your life, is never to shame and condemn you. It's always to say, there's a spot you could put more of me. Let's fill it up. And the second thing I want you to keep in mind is we have infinite grace. Infinite grace means you can restart as many times as you would like. But it doesn't mean that God's okay for you to settle where you're at. You can restart as many times as you would like, but if you're living in something he doesn't want you to live in, that grace is not meant to keep you there and live in mediocrity in that spot. It's not for you to settle in that spot. Okay? There's a lot of truth and tension in the gospel, and, and I just got done with my series on um, some renewing of the mind, some performance-based identity, and I'm switching into a new one. Yeah, we're going to go a little higher in this next one. We're going to let Jesus stretch us in this next one. You guys ready for that? Did you guys like that last series? Some of you did. Some of you are still recovering from it. All right. So when I went through the book of Matthew, you know, every time I get a chance to, to go through the gospel in, in one take, you get a really good idea that Jesus was offensive. Okay? He didn't mince words. And he was pretty much, you're either in or you're out. Like, make up your mind. He wasn't this, like, sit with you in the center and let you make a choice. The guy goes, hey, my dad's old. I'd like to take care of him before I come follow you. He goes, let the dead bury the dead. And he moves on. He says, it's all in now or it's, or it's all out. Don't, don't put me in the middle of this whole thing. So I want to flip with you guys to Revelation 3, 7, or 6, 15 through 16. And this is cool because if you read, there's seven churches and these churches all were passionately for Jesus, and all of them kind of slipped away in some certain form, one or the other. And this is a great place for us to hop. See, people are scared of the book of Revelation because all the old, crazy stuff in the back that takes some interpret interpreting and, and, this, and the apocalyptic literature of it all. But the beginning part, it's pretty much you read through that and you go, okay, where did I land in this? Because if you've been in Christianity for long enough, you've slipped into this in one form or another at some point in time, and you get to pick out and what's going. You get to pick out which one works for you. 
and, and, and see what the promise is if you overcome it. But here in 3, 15 through 16 is what we're going to focus on first. And it's a hard truth. Where are we at? And this is Jesus talking. I know all that you do, and I know that you are neither frozen in apathy nor fervent with passion. How I wish you were either one or the other, but because you are neither cold nor hot, but lukewarm, I am about to spit you from my mouth. See, he's offensive. Yeah, right? He's, and, I, and actually, some translations say vomit you from my mouth. Now, he goes on, it, you know, it says here, I just want to, oh, gosh, I'm stumbling all over myself today. He does give him a chance to repent. We all get a chance to repent. Remember, grace is infinite starting over. But what Jesus is saying is there's no middle ground. You're either all in or you're all out. You're either all for me or you're not for me at all. It's, he said, and if you're in the middle and you're lukewarm and it's mediocre, I'm spitting you out. Because it's better for you to be cold so that the Holy Spirit can convict you in that moment so you can learn how to become red hot and passionate for me. And that's why I wanted to slam on you guys this morning the first one about God's conviction is to empower. Remember that. So if some of you are sitting there, gosh, I, that's what I read when I read this. I'm telling you. When I preach, I'm preaching straight out of my own experience and my own authenticity. I read that and thought I lost a little bit of my passion for the Lord. That's why I'm in Arkansas in the north, what is it, North Arkansas Regional Airport waiting for a plane. I mean, who ends up there? God got my attention and he said, listen. I want you red hot. When it comes to a decision in your life, I don't want you to sit there and rely on yourself and say, yeah, but my wife did this, and yeah, but my owner does this, and yeah, but my business does this, and yeah, it's not about that. God's saying, are you red hot for me? Because I'm going to put a lot of stuff in your path that's going to look like it's going to stumble, and I want you to hear that. He's going to put a lot of stuff in your path. That's going to make it look like you could stumble. And we'll get to that in the, in the second part of the sermon. So are you guys with me so far? Yeah. Hot or cold? On fire or not on fire? <laughs> so then I flipped over to the sower of the seeds. That's a fun one. That's in Matthew 13. So we're going to get through a lot of scripture first, and then I'm kind of going to fly off the handle, and then we're going to go have tacos. So you guys all good with that? <laughs> Later that day, Jesus left the house and sat by the lake shore to teach the people. Soon there were so many people surrounding him that he had to t teach sitting in a boat. Oops, I'm sorry. That's yeah, not this one. 19. 13, 19. We're not going to read the whole chapter. All right, so Jesus is sharing a parable here with those same people that I just introduced. The seed that fell on the beaten path represents the heart of the one who hears the message of the kingdom. I'm sorry, God, we, I'm all over the place. Three. That's later. <laughs> Consider this. There was a farmer who went out to sow seeds. As he cast his seeds, some fell along the beaten path, and the birds came and ate them. Other seeds fell onto the gravel that had no topsoil. The seeds quickly shot up, but when the days grew hot, the sprouts were scorched and withered because they had insufficient roots. Other seeds fell among the thorns and weeds, so when the seeds sprouted, so did the weeds. Crowding out the good plants, but the other seeds, oh, sprouted up, so did the weeds, crowding out the good plants. But other seeds fell on good, rich soil that kept producing a good harvest. Some yielded 30 some 60, and some even 100 times as much as he planted. If you are able to understand this, then you need to respond. So the cool thing about this is the next verse, the apostles go, we don't understand this. <laughs> they go, I don't get what's going on. And Jesus said to them, so, so this is to people who are just learning it for the first time. We have it written in front of us. So this is for us. You've been given the intimate experience of insight into the hidden truths and mysteries of the realm of heaven's kingdom. But those who do not understand this, 
Uh, haven't. For everyone who listens with an open heart will receive progressively more revelation. So I want you guys this morning to just open that. Get, put your hand like this. Open up your heart. Open it up. Because I want you guys to get some, some revelation this morning. So Jesus is teaching a story in a parable. It's about seeds, and it's planting, and it really doesn't make a ton of sense. Uh, but thankfully for us, he tells us in the next part what it's all about. So the seed that fell on the beaten path represents the heart of the one who hears the message of the kingdom realm but doesn't understand it. Then the adversary comes and snatches away what was sown into his heart. So it's not no one in here because you're here. You obviously believe in Jesus, or you're, you want to believe in Jesus, so you're here. And if it is you, then we say, let's, let's change your soil to the one at the end. The seed sown on the, gravel, on the gravel represents the person who gladly hears the kingdom message, but his experience remains shallow. Shortly after he hears it, troubles and persecutions come because of the kingdom message he received. Then he quickly falls away from the, from the truth because the truth didn't sink deeply into his heart. How, how many of you, when you accepted Jesus, kind of walked into a, a hurricane? Both good and bad. In, internally, so good. So much love, so much peace, so much joy. But externally, holy smokes, what the heck is going on? So that's kind of what's going on there. Those, that external turmoil is what the enemy uses to try to knock us off our path. And for, most, or for some of us, especially when it's planted in that soil, we get knocked off. So then the next one is the seed sown among weeds represents the person who receives the message, but all of life's busy distractions. Ooh, see, you got to listen to this one. The seed sown among the weeds represents the person who receives the message, but all of life's busy distractions, his divided heart and his ambition for wealth result in suffocating the kingdom message and prevent him from bearing spiritual fruit. <clears throat> ambition for wealth. Divided heart. Life's busy distractions. I mean, man, that sounds like a day in America, if you ask me. I mean, I'm not, you know what I'm saying? It's okay, because nothing in this parable says that whatever soil you start out in is the one that you stay in forever. And it doesn't say that just because you're in one, you can't move around to the other. See, I think we kind of can flop back and forth because one minute I'm saying, yes, yes, I pushed through, I got that battle, I beat it, I believed in God, I had no divided heart. And on the other side, all of a sudden, I'm looking at my bank account, wondering what's going to happen during this recession. Because ambition for wealth doesn't mean we're obsessed with becoming rich. It means we work by our own hands to make what we have. It means we work by our own might to fill up that bank account, not realizing that the job, the car, the house, the wallet, the credit cards, the debit cards, it all comes from God. Any dollar you have, anything you're working on, it all comes with, from Him. So the ambition for wealth is just whether or not you believe you're working for it or you believe He's working for it. Divided heart, I'm telling you, ever since some of these big miracles we went for didn't come to pass it's sometimes i get in a situation where i know god wants to move and i'm battling inside myself of oh man this didn't happen last time i've been here before life's busy distractions come on i make to-do lists just to torture myself right Because all they are is just this thing in my head that says, I don't have enough time. But who is the provider of time? Who created time? I heard a message last weekend where the guy said, time flies when you're having fun because joy is a part of the kingdom. So when you're in joy, you don't have to be... Time means nothing to you, but when you're focusing on time as a hindrance to you, you're actually pointing out that your relationship with God isn't in right standing in that very moment. <laughs> you don't have to remember it. It's on the video. 
What he's saying is, if you're all of a sudden stressed and you realize you don't have enough time, that's a great opportunity to say, okay, God, what, where am I missing? Where am I missing you in this very moment? Okay, but this is the cool one. As for the seed that fell upon good, rich soil, it represents the heart of, of people, the hearts of people who hear and fully embrace the message of heaven's kingdom realm. Their lives bear good fruit. Some yield a harvest of 30, 60, even 100 times as much as was sown. If you're good soil and you fully embrace the kingdom message, there is a mandate on your life that at minimum you recreate or you uh, inherit 30 times what you sowed in. Sometimes a hundred times. Yes, you can clap for that. <laughs> See, we hold on to all of this stuff because we're scared. We're, we're, we're fearful that Jesus at the end of the day isn't going to actually meet the needs because we hear about people like St. Francis of Assisi who only lived on potatoes and we don't want to just only live on potatoes, you know what I mean? We want more in life, but what God is saying is your yoke is easy and your burden is light. Therefore, that's how he was called to live, but if you give it up to me, you're going to see 30, 60, 100 times of what's going to cause you to fully come alive and the world around you to come alive, and you're going to be living as if you were in the best, wildest part of your dreams, yet I know the dream that's going to match your heart better. Yeah, you don't, you don't, have, to, you don't have to go crazy every time, Logan. It's okay. <laughs> But there's only one thing. It's got to be all. The title of this message is Do or Do Not, There Is No Try. <laughs> Somebody is a Star Wars fan. Thank you. <laughs> it's Yoda. Yoda said that. Because <clears throat> there's no participation trophy. There's no sympathy points. You don't get a pat on the back. It's all or nothing. You're either in, out, or you're vomited out of his mouth. There's only, you're either hot or you're cold, or you're getting spit out. And because he's like, no, go try again. See, but there's grace to try again. That's why there's truth and tension. There's love and honor, and he absolutely adores you. But at the same time, he loves you so much, he's not going to let you live in some mundane existence without fully finding who he called you to be, 30, 60, or 100 fold. He's not just going to let you sit in the middle of this dysfunction and pat you on the back and say, hey, it's going to be okay. Because what he's going to say is if you don't figure this out, it's not going to be okay. You're going to keep butting yourself. You're going to keep butting your head against the same wall for the rest of your life. So why don't I let you go so that you can find the bottom that's going to bring you back to me? Ooh. Jesus walks on water. Matthew 14, 22 through 33. As soon as the people were fed, Jesus told the disciples to get into their boat and to go to the other side of the lake while he stayed behind to dismiss the people. After the crowds dispersed, Jesus went up into the hills to pray. And as night fell, he was there praying alone with God. But the disciples, who were now in the middle of the lake, ran into trouble. For their boat was tossed about by the high winds and heavy seas. At about four o'clock in the morning, Jesus came to them walking on the waves. When the disciples saw him walking on top of the water, they were terrified and screamed, Ah, a ghost. Then Jesus said, Be brave and don't be afraid. I am here. Peter shouted out, Lord, if it's really you, then have me join you on the water. Come and join me, Jesus replied. So Peter stepped out onto the water and began to walk towards Jesus. Bill Johnson has this amazing quote. Water, water longs to be walked on again. Okay, so keep that in your head because I like that. Come and join me. So Peter stepped out towards Jesus. But when he realized how high the waves were, he became frightened and started to sink. Save me, Lord, he cried out. Jesus immediately stretched out his hand and lifted him up and said, What little faith you have. 
Why would you let doubt win? In the very moment they both stepped into the boat, the raging wind ceased. Then all the disciples crouched down before him and worshipped Jesus. They said in adoration, you are truly the Son of God. <clears throat> all right. These guys, and I got some of this from Havilah Cunnington a while back, and these guys were fishermen. They understood the water. So if they were afraid that they were going to die, this was not dramatic and over the top. If they were in a, a storm that was so bad that they were worried for their life, they knew what they were talking about. So here they are in the middle of a, of a life and death experience. Who sent them there? Who told them to go? Jesus. It was him. It was Jesus. So Jesus puts them out in this situation, all right? Then he shows up. Keep in mind, it's four in the morning. How many of you could be in, like, at least even happy at four in the morning after being up all night? I mean, these guys have been through it that day. Jesus comes out. They shriek. It's a ghost. It's not actually a ghost. It's Jesus. Peter gets out of the boat, and he is walking, and he's looking at Jesus. I could just imagine it's just like on a cloud. Like, it's just beautiful and it's peaceful. But remember, they're in the middle of a life and death storm. So now all of a sudden, Peter's like, oh my gosh, what did I do? And he's looking around. And there's all these. And remember, Jesus called him out. Jesus not only sent him into the storm, he called him out onto the waves. And as he's walking, he starts to sink. And he makes a good move. All of us should keep this in our back pocket. Save me, Jesus. <laughs> As I'm drowning, Jesus saves him and puts him back in the boat. And then the storm stops. Then the waters become calm. If I'm Jesus, which I'm not, and thankfully I'm not, I'd say, oh, Peter, you want to come on out? Here, let me calm everything. Let's make the water glass. But when Peter takes his eyes off Jesus, Jesus doesn't go, nice job, dude. Wow, five steps in the water. That's five more steps in the water than any other human before Jesus ever took. But Jesus doesn't go, nice. He goes, you have little faith. Could you imagine being Peter? You're, you're in, you, you feel like you're, it's got to be like an adrenaline rush times 10. You're already in a storm. You feel like you're going to die. Then you see this thing coming up on the water. You think it's a ghost. You're like, oh, I'll go out with you, Jesus. You're out. You're drowning. Jesus is pulling you up. And then at the end of it all, Jesus goes, you didn't have enough faith. It's like, you know, he's a lion and the lamb. There's two truths in tension. Yes, he's the comforter, and he loves us, and he holds us at our weakest moment, but he's not always going to coddle us when he says, you need to step your game up in this area. You can't keep living like this in this area. You can't keep thinking like this. There's, there's a higher truth here, Peter, and you're missing it. If you had, uh, We've all been there. I've been called into so many things with God, and the next thing you know, I'm looking at this wave of finances. I'm looking at this wave of time. I'm looking at this wave of all the things I'm missing out on. I'm looking at this wave of everything that's crashing down on me, and I'm drowning. And at the bottom, I go, oh, save me, Jesus. He pulls me up and goes, we're doing this again, huh? Just keep your eyes on me. Do or do not, there is no try. The best part about it is, is it's all on us and him. He has a special spot for each and, one of, each and every one of us in his heart. He has a special place for us to go. He has a special grace for what you're called to. to. It, my grace might not be the same as Tim's grace, and it might not be the same as Kristen's grace, but wherever I'm supposed to be, that's where the yoke is easy and the burden is light. And even though, 
It may look bad because I'm covered in cow manure. I'm actually birthing something new on the other side. I have to make sure that I'm in perfect relationship with him, that my heart is hot for him, that I don't care what else goes on in my life as long as my relationship with him is the most important thing. It doesn't matter what my wife thinks or my kids think or my boss thinks or my friends think. It, that stuff is all important, but it's not the highest authority in my life. Jesus Christ is the highest authority in my life. And I'll tell you what, if you start to put all those things above him, the relationships are going to be subpar and mediocre because you're going to be, you know, you know, the thing with Jesus is once you've been covered in the cow manure, he helps you clean it off. But if you go back inside without the shower, now there's some on your wife, and there's some on their, your kids, and there's some in your bed, and there's some on your wall, and there's some everywhere. And your house stinks. And your life stinks. The, this new series is, the, is, 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 is called Christians Are Supposed to Look Like Something. You're supposed to be something. You're supposed to be more than the world around you. You're not supposed to look like the world around you. You're not supposed to talk like the world around you. You're not supposed to act like the world around you. We all get sucked into it and real and forget. When you were a first century Christian, who this was written to, when you accepted Jesus, it was a pretty big deal because A, you were locked in a Jewish religion that called for you to act, behave, and be a certain way. And if you weren't, your family was called by the law to boot you. And that's what they did. When Jesus says to follow me means you got to forsake your kids and your mom and your dad and your wife, he wasn't lying back then. When, he, when they followed Jesus, everybody in their life would turn on them and send them out, and they'd get taken in by these communities. And then the Romans didn't even like you. You were at, you were at stake of being executed. So for him to say give it all for them is way more for us. Christianity in America is easy. It's easy. Watered down. Served to you on four-inch foam seats. Guys, I give you good sermons, but the easy, soft ones, sometimes you guys, you know, this time I'll feed you. We're getting some ribeyes out. We're doing meat today. And some of you might choke a little bit, but it's okay. We play the cool songs. They used to worship in caves. They literally had to give it all. And we have a hard time standing up for what's right in a situation at work because we're worried about losing our job. We have a hard enough time telling somebody at the water cooler to stop gossiping because we don't want to be known as that guy. When somebody's talking inappropriately about women in a group of men, are you the one that stands up for it? Tells them, nah, I'm not going there, we shouldn't talk like that, or do you just laugh it off? Maybe you're still stuck in sin. Cool thing about Jesus is the disciples hung out with him for three years. And then it was a few, few weeks after that that they finally got the Holy Spirit and became powerful people that manifested 30, 60, 100-fold in their life. Up until that point, he was very patient with it. He was very patient with each and every one of them, just like he'll be very patient with us. But to keep on the theme, I hear him saying this morning to some of us, it's time to crap or get off the pot. I want the 30. You notice the bottom line is 30? I'd take a two-fold increase. But bottom line is 30, 60, 100. But we got to be hot. We got to be on fire. We got to be passionate. This morning is a call for those who have went away from that, who have any point in their life lost their first love. You think back to that first year of, of walking with Jesus and how beautiful 
and, and sentimental and everything was new and everything smelled great and everything was good and you were seeking first the kingdom and all things were added to you and next thing you know, all things became waves and you took your eyes off Jesus and your heart became a little bit colder and now you're lukewarm and now you're kind of under it because he spit you out but he's saying, you don't have to live there. Come back. Get your fire back. Let's put some flame on that. Let's put some gas on that. Let's get that flamethrower out. Let's shoot that thing. Let's burn that thing to a crisp right now inside of you. Because I don't want anyone to think that Jesus wants anything less than everything you have. So stand with me this morning. Put your hands on your heart. I want you to start feeling that thing warm up inside of you. I'm serious. There's some of you who are going to feel an actual heat coming into your heart right now because God's saying, if you want it, I'm here. If you want it, I'm here. Jesus is very clear in the scriptures. If you don't, that's fine. I'm moving on. But if you want it, I'm right here. So Lord, right now we just release. We release a fresh fire and a fresh anointing and a fresh power of you into their life, Lord. We, have, we, we release a fresh power into my life, Lord, a fresh fire into my heart, Lord. God, that anywhere where there's ice on my heart, Lord, would just melt off right now. I want to be fully for you, God. I, I, we want to be fully for you, Lord, in everything that we do, in all of our ways, Lord. We want to just think of you, long for you, love you, be all for you, just hug on you and hang with you. God, may the intimacy of my relationship with you be the most important part of my life from this day forward, Lord. May we just long for every aching moment with you, God. May I sound absolutely crazy in what I want from you, Lord. Just continue to melt their hearts, Father, this morning. We want the full meal deal. We want to lick the plate. We don't want the crumbs under the table. We want, we want the all-you-can-eat buffet. Tacos. We thank you, God. We thank you. You put up with us, and we really love that. All right, you guys can be seated. We're going to ramp this thing down a second. Then we're going to have some food. You guys like that? Yeah. Yeah. Dang. My phone is all full of sweat from drumming. I want to end with this, so especially with a word like that over, so I want to put this over our um, meal. Matthew eleven nine, Matthew nine eleven. The Pharisees asked Jesus' disciples, "Why would your master dine with such low lights?" That's what the church thinks of us. That's what religion thinks of us. But that's who Jesus hangs out with. So even though he's calling us into a deeper relationship, he's calling us into a higher purpose. He's still okay with us when we're in the middle of being low lives. He'll still dine with us and hang out with us and have a good time. He just doesn't want to hang out there with you forever. So thanks for letting me share today, guys. I'll have Alicia come up and explain the meal. And you guys have a wonderful week. Wow. Thanks, Pastor Sean. Um,
So we have a we have a Mexican fiesta today, and we have like some special treats today because Sal actually made pork carnitas, and he's actually going to serve us today. He's actually grilled up the tortillas and the whole bit, and he also brought uh, somebody help me. I don't know what the mean. What is it? Horchata. 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 Oh, that's what he brought. So that's in the. That's in a cooler on the counter also, um, and what? I don't know. Probably him. I don't know. So uh, everything is set. Matt Hone's been back there working away, and um, I forgot to make an announcement about next week because for some of you heard it was outside during the service. You're probably like, I don't know if I could sit in the heat the whole time. Barb and Leroy, I know it's a problem, uh, concern of yours. The, the service will be on the deck with some people being able to be in the house too. So if you want to just come for the service, it'll, you can sit in the house as well. In two weeks. That's the service on the 28th that he's talking about. That's the service that you're not going to come here for. You're going to go to Sean and Libby's house. This is yes. We're not going to come here to the building because there will be nobody here. There probably will be somebody here hanging out just in case people forget. But, but that person will want to go to the service too, so don't do that. Um, so thank you, God, for this food. Thank you for the provision. You, you provided way, way a lot of food today. So thank you for all the hands that have prepared it and help us to all be courteous and thankful, and thank you for your generosity, in Jesus' name, amen. Have everybody have a good week. <laughs>